Good afternoon. Welcome everyone. Um, as we wait for more folks to join, please let us know in the chat where you're watching from. Love to hear where you're where you're tuning in from. I'm Holly Rosewood and I'm a program manager at the Pulitzer Center. If you haven't joined us before, we're a nonprofit journalism and education organization. We support more than 170 reporting projects each year in collaboration with news outlets around the world, then work with classrooms and public spaces to elevate engagement with these issues. We're based in Washington, DC, but our work and our staff are global. A few logistics before we get into today's conversation. You'll see a Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. You can begin adding your questions there at any time. Um, there's also a chat icon on the bottom of your screen. Uh, we'd appreciate if you just save that for tech concerns. And we want you to let you know that we are recording the session and we'll post it online after we're done today. And one final note, please stay a little bit longer after the session ends to begin uh, to participate in a brief survey. Now I'd like to briefly introduce today's speakers. Myra Burns is a recovery coach who is giving back, helping those who feel left behind and sharing her experiences and life openly with others. Pendarvis Harshaw is a journalist, author, and educator. He has taught journalism to high school students as well as incarcerated men and is a staff writer and podcast producer at KQED. Bahim Reese is the founder of Motivated to Help Others, a physical fitness program and movement. Brandon Tausick is a photographer and filmmaker based in Los Angeles. His work has received reviews from The Guardian, The Washington Post, Time, Vice, and many others. And our conversation will be moderated by Alexandra Bailey, the end life imprisonment strategist at the sentencing project, excuse me. To start though, I'll turn things over to Brandon and Penn, the creators of the Facing Life Project to tell us a little bit more about that. Thank you all so much, Brandon. Hey there, yeah, thanks for that intro and uh, thanks everyone for joining us today uh, as we talk through uh, Pendarvis and I's new project, Facing Life. Um, so just to kind of give some, some context on the project before I pass it to Penn. Uh, this project started in early 2018. Um, both Pendarvis and I were living in Oakland at the time and were, he was aware of my work as a photographer and filmmaker. I was aware of his work as a writer. We were friends, but we had not yet made work together. So um, we caught wind that the Pulitzer Center had received an endowment to fund work along the lines of mass incarceration in the United States. So we put our heads together, um, came up with kind of an idea of a project that we could make together, uh, kind of based around the reentry experiences of former lifers in California for a myriad of reasons that Penn will go into. Um, and at that point, we basically kicked off and then we finished uh, a few years later, basically about two weeks ago, we released the project online and uh, everything lives on our website, facing.life. Um, the project is a digital project, um, a multimedia project. It's not a film, although it has components of video. It's not a long read, although it has components of text. It has um, cinemagraphs, uh, 360 VR videos. It's kind of a, a browser-based experience that exists online for free forever that uh, you, know, you don't need to attend a film festival to watch or go to a white cube gallery to view. Um, and that was really important as we kind of started this project is making something that could be seen by all and used as a, really as, as a tool um, to uh, get out there and to kind of expand the message uh, that the project has. So with that, I think I'll pass it to Pendarvis. You can explain a little bit about the, the nitty gritty, the policy and kind of the context also behind the project. Thanks for that, Brandon. Thanks for having us. For the people from the Pulitzer Center, thanks for joining us, audience out there, and big thanks to our panelists. I'm excited to hear you all talk, so I'll be brief. Again, my name is Pendarvis Harshaw, journalist from Oakland, California, currently inside of an apartment in Sacramento, but all in all in California, we are at ground zero when it comes to discussion about justice in America. And California has seen its ups and downs, a lot of downs, uh, sp specifically when it comes to mass incarceration. This is the home of the three strikes law. This is a place where uh, the numbers of people behind bars have just been astounding over the past couple of decades. Uh, on the heels of that, um, in 2011, the state was, uh, there was a court case, a Supreme Court case, 
that required the state to depopulate its prisons, um, bring the population down to 137.5% of what it's designed to have. And at one point, the state was nearly 200% at its capacity. So knowing that and knowing that the state has changed a number of laws, um, that the state has uh, shifted some of its prison practices and seeing that the prison population was coming down, we realized that again, we're at ground zero of this discussion. As a storyteller, I saw this and said, you know what? These people who are coming out of prison, who've served long, long sentences, specifically life sentences, they have stories that need to be told. And I'm wondering who's there to assist them as they re-enter society and land on their feet. This isn't just a prison story. This isn't just a justice story. This is a community story. Even more importantly, this is a people story. So we took it upon ourselves, myself and Brandon, we found eight individuals who represent this huge population of people incarcerated, and we essentially followed them for four years, um, asking them about everything from how do you get a job to how do you find housing to like, how do you navigate new technology, Bluetooth and automatic toilet flushers. And that's what we got details about. And so in the written portions of, of this piece, you'll see that we highlight uh, people's early lives, um, pre-prison, we dive into what they experience behind the bars. And then what most importantly, we look at what their lives are like now, essentially facing a new form of life. Um, these eight individuals held from all different areas, uh, have been incarcerated in throughout the state. Uh, and now they are out. Unfortunately, one of the individuals highlighted in this series, Jose, he has passed. Um, but even um, following his story is really important. And so, uh, again, I wanted to be brief, but just give you some more context about what we're here to discuss. And the, for the purpose of this panel, we're not only discussing justice in California, but we're broadening that discussion to justice in the United States and trying to get a full frame picture of what it looks like right now. And I believe there's a tug of war between laws that are quote unquote tough on crime and uh, this ethos of um, restorative justice. And so that's what I really look forward to discussing today. Um, I think this is the part of my spiel where I pass it along to Alexandra Bailey of the Sentencing Project, the host for today, and I'll let y'all have it. Thank you. Thank you so much for that explanation, and thank you so much for inviting me to moderate uh, this panel. Um, my name is Alexandra Bailey. I lead the campaign to end life imprisonment at the Sentencing Project, and we're going to be having a really important discussion today because the work that has been done um, on facing life uh, really encapsulates an incredible national problem, highlights uh, what I believe is the legacy of America's original sin um, and is um, a pandemic of mass incarceration that has grown steadily and does not seem to be going anywhere. Um, so I'd like to start by having each one of our panelists introduce themselves. Um, if you could tell everyone your name um, and just give a, a, a brief summary of who you are and then I will jump into uh, giving you the third degree. So let's start with Myra. Hi, my name is Myra Burns. Most people call me Angel. Um, I did 36 years in prison. I've been home almost four years. Uh, I work in the health and wellness department. At my job, I help administer the medication to the women here that's been issued by the doctors. And I'm actually enjoying being on this side of the medication versus the other side, trying to get meds. And um, I'm here whenever you want to get busy, Alexandra. Happy to have you here. Thank you. Fahim. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Fahim Al-Kadir, AKA Lejean Reese, which is my birth name. But thank you for having Fahim Reese on there because it shows um, two parts of who I am. But um, yes, uh, I'm someone who was justly impacted at the age I was sentenced to 43 years in life. I ended up doing 30 years and 10 months. I was paroled from Old Folsom State Prison. Currently, I am the construction instructor of uh, Rising Sun, which is a pre apprenticeship program, which you saw me with the chop saw while I, was, um, I went to that program for two and a half months. And um, since being at home, I was able to create uh, Motivated Help Others, which is a nonprofit organization. And as um, you said earlier, it's about um, using fitness, education, mentorship, you know, really to just uh, um, give back um, to the community of Richmond, West Valley, really uh, try to expand who I am. And so, but in brief, 
those um, some of the things that I'm doing right now, but uh, it's a lot that I'm doing. So I just wait for the moderator to ask all of the questions needed. All right. Well, speaking of the moderator asking all the questions, let's jump right in. So one in seven people is serving um, a life sentence and uh, two thirds of black men in, in prison are serving a life sentence. And the rate of incarcerated women has jumped by 700% since 1980. And at the Sentencing Project, we write out a whole lot of data. But what we have today is the actual lived experience of what those statistics actually mean. Um, so I'll start with our creators, Brandon and Pendarvis. So of all the things that you could cover, of all of the joyous subject matter that you could cover, you go to mass incarceration and you specifically go to life sentences. Now, I think it goes without saying that in the term of sympathetic subjects of the way people like to paint mass incarceration, you went for the more um, honest but difficult conversation of life sentences, the concept where we throw people away. Um, they are irredeemable. They are the worst of the worst. And we dismiss this as a society um, and we warehouse people. And so you decided to go there specifically. Why did you make that choice? I think, I mean, looking at it again, what I said in my preamble is that it's ground zero, California, in terms of what we've experienced in terms of mass incarceration. And if we're gonna to get to the, the lowest floor of ground zero, then we look at the people most, most impacted and we look at lifers and we look at what can be done about mass incarceration. And we start to think about the studies that have, have happened as of late in terms of how a child's mind develops and what, how they're sentenced, how people are sentenced as children, as well as how a person who's incarcerated or a people in general's mind develop in terms of aging and aging out of crime per se. And so there's a lot to unpack there. And with that said, if I'm a, if I'm a journalist, if I'm a storyteller and I see like a comet hit the ground, I know the importance of telling this story, right? And I just had to look at this situation as that. This is a huge story and it has a lot of parts and we just told a small piece of it. Um, Brandon, I'd, I'd like to pass that to you and talk about why using cinemagraphs is important in telling this story as well. Yeah, I mean, with cinema graphs, you get to uh, uh, our experience online is is so quick and so bite sized uh, and so shallow. And with the project, uh, we just kind of, you know, we wanted to create something that was accessible online, but we also wanted to create something that would kind of slow that pace down. And so with the cinema graphs, kind of a meditation on time, uh, hybrid medium between photography and filmmaking. Um, ideally, it, it kind of ties in to that effect. And then kind of tying back into, you know, your original question, Alexandra, and what Penn was saying, um, you know, I think there's a lot of misconception around lifers because often they are the ones that were uh, at least accused of uh, the quote unquote worst crimes in our society. And so a lot of people kind of, uh, their mind goes to like Charles Manson or like these, these far left field cases that are completely unrealistic to the, the median and the bulk of people that are serving life sentences. So we wanted to find eight of those really just middle road people that were serving life sentences, dig deep into their past, their stories, and um, present it the way we did. Yeah, you really kind of only have to go to Twitter to, to go to the sensational, but you know, we have two incredible people here with us, Myra and Fahim. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, 37 and 31 years respectively, is that correct? Yes. Yes. 36. But yes, 36. collectively 30, what, 68 years. And um, yeah, Brandon, you, you spoke about choosing a medium that showed the, the slowness of time, um, which you all spent a lot of time. You gave a lot of your life to the horrors of our criminal justice system. And upon stepping out of that system, why did you decide to take part in this project? And Myra, we'll start with you. I mean, I have a, I used to have a very bottom line distaste for men. And that changed progressively through some of the staff that I was incarcerated with. But um, when they came to me, 
about the project, I looked at both of them and it was the things that Pendarvis had said to me. First of all, he took me out for tacos. So that's a start. You know, I love tacos. And we had a conversation, but in that conversation, I learned some things about him. He's a father of a young girl. Uh, he had, he told me, hold on for a minute. I had to do some things. And when he was on the phone, he was speaking to the mom about his daughter, you know, and he politely told me when he got off the phone, hey, look, we got to be done because I got to go get my daughter. And that meant something to me because that shows that he's involved in her life and she's important. So I'm a girl, you know, but the things that he said to get me to engage in it, I need for the world to hear what's happening to my female constituents inside of that institution and what's happening to us when we go to court and when we go to that boardroom and they talk all that, you know, bullshit. Oh, well, we're going to be getting to that um, and specifically the female experience. But Fahim, you know, 31 years and then somebody comes up to you and says, hey, can you tell me about that time? What was your reaction when they first approached you? Well, I received a, uh, I believe it was a phone call. And uh, I was first, I was like, how you get my phone number? <laughs> you know, I'm like, cause I'm, I'm still in a halfway house. Got you it. Know? And so they started talking to me. I think it was, I think it was um, Brandon. And then he said, yeah, he was Brandon. And then, you know, he now, said- Were you also to- bribed with tacos? No, no, but, but there are uh, the openness, the respect, uh, being genuine and told me, you know, what they were trying to do, what the project was about. Um, it wasn't about, you know, trying to exploit me, a sport, a sport, a story is just really just trying to get, um, answers and get as, uh, PM is saying, you know, it's all about ground zero, you know, get to the root of a thing. And I told myself once I was released that I wanted to be someone who can come out, you know, and be able to just talk about the things that I went through and know, uh, and pray and hope that um, it can ha- help and save others, you know. And so uh, once we had a chance to sit down and talk and uh, engage and set up dates to meet our first meeting, I think we did was uh, in Oakland at the mosque at the masjid, you know, it, um, it was it was good from there. It was good. Well, the project is beautiful. So thank you both for sharing your story. But I want to take a step back in time prior to when you stepped out of those gates. Yes. Um, Myra, you shared with me and you also shared in in your story that um, you were ready for a long time to come home. Um, And yet you were not permitted to because of what you were sentenced to. And then SB... 260 passes. What happened for you the day you got that news? Oh, Myra, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Can hear you now. There we okay. go. <laughs> um, for me, the change was like totally awesome because I got sentenced, I, I got arrested when I was 21. My crime happened when I was 21. And SB 260, that particular uh, bill passing brought the age of the mental growth of an individual into light. And it came into play from 18. At that time, it was 23. Then they redid it and they added on to it to 25. And when they did that, it was like, whoa, you know, it changed how they are supposed to look at us for freedom. So first thing people need to realize is, is just because the bill passes or it changes things, it doesn't mean that you're still going to get just, wow, you're going to get cut loose and be free. You still got a whole lot of hoops and monkey bars and chains and everything else that you got to climb and crawl to prove that you're still worthy of being able to be free. And that right there was like, okay, so some of the things that you've done in your past in the prison at that very moment that that bill passes, you realize, oh shit, all this stuff I've done in the past is gonna catch up with me. Or you're like, I'm glad I did this or I did that. You know, you learn how to think for your future without even having one. 
And that's that's hard to do, but you keep hope alive. Your family helps you keep hope alive. There are some good correctional officers that have supported, you know, like, hey, don't do nothing stupid. You never know. Laws change all the time. You do have those, but you have that many of those, and then you got this many of them. You ain't going to never fucking get out of prison. And da, 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 da. And when you're preparing for it, the key word is heinousness. That's the worst word ever been instilled inside of a dictionary. Preparing for a future, even though you know you don't have one. We're going to come back to that. Yeah. When you got the news, SB 260 passes. Where were you? What changed for you? Uh, Well, prior to that changing, the three, they was just going uh, through the process of the three strikes law. Mm-hmm. And so some people was going home, you know, prior to, to that bill passing. So I was like, wow, here's some hope. Mm-hmm. So different little bills were starting to come out. But once that SB 260 came, I said, okay. The small glimmer of hope, what Mara was talking about, mm-hmm. I started seeing some daylight. I started seeing some daylight, right? Before I was being ready to come, to come home, at that particular time, when I was first suitable to come home in 2014, and I was denied, was I ready to come home then? I wasn't ready. Because if I was ready then, then I would have been released. So I had to go back and understand, you know, who I was as a human being, my purpose. I had to go understand my cause of the factors. What caused me to become a crossroad? What caused me to have different triggers? You know, different things will cause my anger. What caused me basically to go into a lifestyle, what became my addiction. So once I started figuring that out and start getting into these self-help programs to start changing my thinking from negative to positive, and that bill started coming around because I also knew from reading it, it wasn't a, um, a get out of jail free card. So I, really, so I really had to you know buckle down. When I first went to the parole board in 2014, it's Show me because they went back and used old write ups to 2019 for a cell phone. So I was still caught up in my addictive, my addictive criminal behavior by holding a cell phone at that particular time. And me having a cell phone, I needed that. As I told the parole board, that was my gateway, my pathway to stay connected to the society. So I, when it's time for me to come home, I can have a bit of um, understanding, you know, of what you know what I have to deal with. And so when two SB 260 came, you know, uh, I was happy. I was elated, but I knew I really had to buckle down and do the things that I needed to do with the board um, of parole hearings are going to expect out of me. Um, on that note, we have this brief one minute video of, of Fahim describing uh, passing the parole board. Let's take a look. As they said, we do not deem you a current threat to society. I bust out crying like a baby. I just felt all the relief. All the burden, 30 years plus. And I thought about the victims, my family, my loved ones, people who I lost in the past. It's everything just started coming back to me. I thought about my grandmother because I always told myself once uh, once I was released, I always wanted my grandmother to be there. You know. In the commission, she said, uh, Fahey, we thank you for being forthcoming, for telling the truth. She said, when you live your life, live it for your victims. Give back. And, and since I've been home, I've been on my feet doing everything I can to be a better man in the society. Man. Oh, Brandon, why'd you have to show that? Man. Uh, <laughs> thanks a lot. <laughs> All um, over again. <laughs> So the thing that struck me about all of these stories and Fahim and and Meyer, your stories was the sort of very bittersweet nature of them, because this project in a lot of ways felt very uplifting, right? It was about this second chance, the incredible things that you all are doing now, which we're going to get deeper into in a second. But like you said before, Myra, you created a future when everybody told you that you didn't have one that was not gonna be afforded to you. And yet somehow you hang on to the fact that maybe something could change. 
And so you were so joyful and yet so sad in that video, Fahim. That moment where they said that you're no longer a threat, you burst out crying. What were you feeling? Oh, like a cement truck where was sitting on my back for so long. Didn't break my back. It finally rolled off of me. Everything was just released. And uh, and I told myself that they that monster, the heinous person they thought I was, that calculated person I thought I was, I'm gonna come home and be the difference and be the change what I'm supposed to be. And uh, and I continue to do that. And uh, I'm gonna strive to do that to the day I die, God willing. I believe that, Myra. So they tell you that uh, freedom, freedom is going to be yours. What did you feel in that moment? You know, when when she told me, the commissioner, when she was talking, she was reading off of this paper and she was reading all these things to me. I was sitting there and I was thinking, OK, wait a minute. She said she started talking about how, you know, uh, the rules of engagement as far as how they look at us being juveniles versus how it was before. And, you know, I was just sitting there literally like this, like, OK, here we go with this shit again. But. When she shut the D.A. down, he was really like just going there and he kept asking me the same question, but he kept twisting it. And then I told him, I said, listen. How many times do you expect for me to answer the same question? I'm going to give you the same answer every time, no matter how you twist it up. And then she kind of caught it and she said, look, if you don't have anything else to ask her, we're going to move on. And at that moment, I realized a little glimmer of hope. I said, wait a minute, I really might be going home here. But when she got to reading that, she said, Ms. Burns, we're finding you suitable for parole today. And I was looking at her like, what? Did you say you finding me suitable? And she said, yeah. And I just started crying like a three-year-old kid, man. I was just like, <laughs> I had the ugly face, the whole nine yards, the heat, because it was like, finally, 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 because this is the second time. They took it from me the first time they found me suitable. And that was after my mom had passed. And then they took me back a little under 16 months and gave it back to me. But a lot of things happened in that year. And going along with what Fahim said, even though they gave it to me and they took it, I told you earlier, I wasn't ready because I was so angry about my mom being dead. Mm -hmm. But when I went back and got it, I was ready. I feel like my mom went up there and posted my bail. And that's how I live with it every day. It took you seven attempts at the parole board, correct? Seven times, yep. And Fahim, it took you four times before the parole board? Yes. Before you were released? Four times. You want to know what always amazes me when I meet lifers and I meet them all over the country is the fact that they're judged by this one moment in time. A 19-year-old is frozen in a moment. And then they are just forced to live there as if nothing changes with them. And yet the world changes. And so you all receive, they say you're suitable to come back, you cry, and now you have to be back in society. And Fahim, one of the things that struck me about your story was when you were talking about how much you wanted pancakes, that you just yeah. really wanted pancakes. And that like the first time you saw a Target self-checkout kiosk, like, you know, that it just kind of like blew your mind. It did, it so, did. One of my friends actually described it of like going into Willy Wonka's chocolate factory. Like you just have no idea about what the world is now, apart from a lot of the things that you've heard. What was it like for you? Did First of all, did you get your pancakes right away? Yes. Yes. I got the pancakes. <laughs> okay. You got uh, your pancakes right away. And then yeah. what, what was your experience? Like those first couple of days when you were home? Okay. Uh, my family, you know, some of my cousins, uh, aunties and uncles, they were uh, waiting out at the gate for me. So they had a video. They yelled when I came outside. And uh, some of them I didn't expect. When we went to Pancake House, they, well, they like, what you want to eat? Let's go to Pancake House. It was 
like five minutes away um, in Folsom, you know, the city of Folsom. So we went there. I had the omelet, the pancakes. And then um, I went outside. I'm just looking outside of Pancake House waiting for my order. And my auntie, Alice, she said, what's wrong? She said, what you looking at? I say, I'm looking at the sporting goods store. I had like 700 bucks in my pocket when I parole with. And she said, what you, I said, I'm going to walk to the store, you know, to the sporting goods store. First time ever going to a store. She said, so she walked over there with me. She said, well, what you going to buy? I said, I'm going to buy some shorts and a jump rope and a shirt. She said, why? I said, because I love exercising, but I got to execute this plan. And so I bought the jump rope. I bought my shorts. And that was in that first day, even before I entered to halfway house. I remember, I'm just leaving out the gate of Folsom, barely an hour and a half. It was time for me to put my plan together with my fitness, uh, more ready to help others. Because if I would have deviated, digressed from any other way, there's no telling what could have happened. And so uh, it was good. The food pancakes was good. You know, my grandmother used to make the best pancakes. Uh, and so I had to have it. But being incarcerated, when you, you know, you go to the kitchen, you get these hard box pancakes. You got to peel off. They bought this. They bought this big. You know, the syrup barely has sugar up in it. Oh, man. Uh, yeah. You, ain't got you, no, might, you no might find sugar. a friend who um, worked in the kitchen who could make you some special pancakes. He had to sneak them to you. And mm -hmm. then you have to eat. And uh, But that particular time, uh, yes, Alexandra, I can see that every day. It was on and cracking. It was on. <laughs> Yes. Well, Myra, let's let's turn to you then. And Fahim, it's awesome that you just instituted your plan right away. And clearly you're just on a rolling train with it. <laughs> so, uh, Myra, you step back into the world. What was that first couple of days like? Well, you know what? My 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 friend, my sister, her name is Deidre Wilson. She is a member of the CCWP, the Coalition for Women's Prisoners. Mm -hmm. She came and picked me up. She drove up from Los Angeles and picked me up and I wanted a Mountain Dew Red. I had been watching this commercial on TV, <laughs> you know, and, and I wanted some El Pollo Loco chicken and a cheesecake. It was all a letdown. The Mountain Dew Red wasn't worth it. The El Pollo Loco chicken, it looked like a pigeon. And the cheesecake was damn near $7. And I told her, I said, if this cheesecake is worth $7, when I shit, it better be some gold bricks up in here. <laughs> because I never remember cheesecake costing that much for a slice about this big. But the greatest part of that was being in the car with her, mm -hmm. just talking, just rolling on the road, looking out the window, seeing a dog like a free dog or a cat or seeing free kids, seeing a little bitty teeny tiny baby that was up close and personal to me. And, you know, just like different things, looking at the stores and different color trees. I mean, I seen a few trees here and there, but like a tree tree, you know, a weeping willow and mm -hmm. all that stuff. And I have to, I have to say that there were so many people that supported me it did not make me miss my family, mm -hmm. that part of my family, because I had no family. My mom's gone. So the the hardcore part of my family is in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and we're working on that. But the family that I developed that adopted me is they're magnificent people. They're good people. They're still in my life. It, I mean, I got it's a whole damn two or three villages raising me still well because I, like you know like yes it's 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 just i don't know well, pendarvis you're lucky that you didn't mess up those tacos she might not even be in this story if you had messed if you brought some pollo yoko and that little pigeon or whatever you might not have even had a story oh, nah, he took me to a spot the one. That's what did it. <laughs> yeah. you know when them little they call it the hole in the wall so Those are the best restaurants. So y'all get home and the project, you decided to focus on the difficult parts of reentry, housing, jobs, moving your life forward. How did you pick the different things that you were going to cover with each person? We, we kind of, in some ways, 
lived with them. Like as they're talking, like for him, I was like, yeah, we did go into that mosque and we went to the gym and we talked about like you did construction on the Golden State Warriors Coliseum. And like we went to your graduation. We went to Myra's graduation. We hung out with Myra. She was doing work in the different myriad of jobs. She's had so, so many jobs. Um, <laughs> we, hung, we went to both of your houses. Like yeah. we really got into their lives. And um, there's something to say about like, you know, the editorial process of like what you cut stays on the, the editing floor or whatever. But it's really easy when you just sit back and reflect on it, like as a human, like not even as a journalist in terms of mindset, but like what experiences that I take in as a human that stick with me that I would talk to a friend about in a cafe or at a bar or a barbecue, you know, like I live this experience with these people. And so it wasn't so hard to choose. I think um, there were a couple of key pieces where it was like, okay, we have to make sure to amplify what they're talking about specifically around um, support systems and like each one reaching one, you know, somebody gets out ahead of them, they tap into them. Um, that was important for us to highlight. But other than that, everything was just genuine. Like, what did I take in as a human living with this other human? Yeah, I mean, um, I think that is the thing that really struck me about this project is that you really seem to have gotten each of the people that you interviewed. So during those four years, you got these, these two suckers following you around all up in your business. Did other people in your life wonder what on earth you were doing? Uh, for me, too many people didn't know uh, what we were doing. We started at a, I was in a transitional home. I think I was barely home a month when we began a project. Mm -hmm. I was barely home a month. I'm here. I am in downtown Oakland. And so we, so now we talk about acclimation back into the society, um, being able to understand, you know, uh, a land or a city, what you once knew, what became foreign to you. And when I came home, I liked to just walk. I wanted to be a part of the public transportation, tra transit system for us to bar the bus and all that. I really didn't want too many people to um, give me a ride around. Mm -hmm. And so when I met Brandon and Penn, and them following me around, coming to my life and to my house and everything that I had going on, it was just a welcoming. You know, the spirit was warm. It was like, come on, let's do what we need to do. So if anyone did have anything to say, uh, I didn't really hear it. I didn't really hear because my focus was on the things, what I had to do and what was going on in my life at that time. And, it, and I was so engrossed in it, I couldn't wait till the project was done. Yeah, it was fun because I wanted to really see it. So, as, as Pam was saying, so it could be amplified, and so the world can see, you know, what we go through as human beings, yeah. you know, and uh, as people. And that's what it was for me, just being able to just um, be a part of something great. Absolutely. All right, what about you? Well, for me, it was like it was totally cool, especially when Brandon came to my church. They were like who's the little boy? I said, well, you know, and then I had to think about it. He is a little guy. And so I explained what was going on. You know, they were like, oh, well, we got to pray for him. And is he hungry? And I told Brandon, I said, come on. He says, is it going to be cool? I go, oh, yeah, come on. He came on in there and they hugged him and embraced him. And, you know, my my church, Market Street Church is something else. Them, them little old ladies at my church are some prayer warriors. And he caught a moment right there. And I love them. They have supported me through a lot. But I think, like, like Fahim is saying, it's been them. It's how they are as human beings that made it easy to bring them in. Like I said, I have a very, very strong distaste for men. And that's changed. And in meeting Penn and Brandon, it changed even more. I mean, it was like, they're not like regular guys. They don't even act like regular guys. They act like humans, you know? And Brandon did something special. And if I ever have a chance to share it with you, I will. And Pendarvis, like I said, what got me is his communication with his daughter. Because during the graduation, she was dragging him around in the chair and we were cracking up. 
So, you know, they made you want to tell your story. They made you want to touch bases and put it out there so we can get help for our peers. Mm -hmm. Well, I hope that everybody will go and check out the project and read through all of the stories. Um, Before we get to our question and answer section, um, we live in a society where what the news is telling us is that we are in an ever more dangerous society, um, that things are only getting worse and that incarceration is the only method of public safety that will work and that people don't change. But you all are here living evidence that people do change. And so what will you say to those people? Myra, let's start with you. You want me to be honest? I do. Well, stick a plug in it. You know, and I'm going to say that's nicely putting it. Stick a plug in it because you lock us up and you tell us, oh, well, if you change, if you can change the beast or the monster, whoever you used to be, we'll let you back out. But what you fail to realize is, is when you tell certain people that, they believe just that. And they start making those changes inside. And then when you go to the board, you want to sit there and lie to me, telling me you want to use that word, like I said, heinousness of the crime. No matter what happens, the heinousness of the crime doesn't change. But I did. I do. We do. And that's the part that they're not paying attention to. Mm -hmm. It's all about the almighty dollar. But then when we get out here, there's no resources. Mm -hmm. There's no nothing to help us to continue. So what happens? We help each other. Mm hmm. But that can't always be. We need some help. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Ooh, this part just pisses me the fuck off. Because they need to pay attention to what you're doing. You're massively incarcerating people. You're costing the taxpayers, my mother, his mother, your own mother, more money to keep people locked up than you are setting them free. Absolutely. Absolutely. On that note, just quickly before we go to Fahim, I'd love to play this, this quick clip of Myra, um, who does still go back into the prison that she served uh, three decades in. And uh, yeah, I'll just let her words speak. I wanted them to see what freedom looks like. I looked at the people who I started my time with that were still there. And that was so heartbreaking. They look so old and just beat the hell down by the system. Some of them looked hopeless. Some of them looked like, they're the same age as me and they looked 90. And I was just like, and when I walked into the auditorium, somebody, they were all just like staring at me. And then somebody said, Angel? And I was like, I waved and then it was like, that's Angel. And I was like, oh, my God. And they were like trying to come, you know, and I was like, wait, you know, there's a time for it. Not right now. But they were like, and then I seen some of them crying because they were so happy to see me. And I just, you know, that's a whole nother family. And they're just there. And it's like, it's nothing that I can do for them except stay free the right way, you know? So powerful, so powerful. Ooh, you out, you out of line. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> just civil break yeah, because I, that's, that's my family. Those ladies in there are my family and I miss them and I want to help them get out. And when they get out here, I want to have help for them. You know, I am I miss them, but I don't miss them enough to go back, but I miss them enough to keep struggling for them to get to me. Well, that's how it should be. Fahim, you little jerk. <laughs> I know, right? Got everybody crying on this panel. You know, <laughs> Fahim, pe- people say that, uh, you know, people don't change, that uh, there's only one solution to this. What do you say to them? I say that they don't know. I said, they haven't took the time to really understand who we are. They have uh, asked the pertinent questions we need to be asked about who are these people? Why they do what they do? Uh, What does a second chance look like? Uh, How can we help them? 
what type of assistance and resources that they need prior to coming home. And forget prior to coming home, what type of assistance and resources they need prior to coming, come going to jail. Because we have a lot of youth out here in society to this day who need mentors, who need credible mentors, credible messengers, mm -hmm. um, who can come in their lives and help steer them uh, on the right path for making those near or early death decisions. Mm -hmm. They need them type of people to come in their life. You know, it's all about pushing paperwork. It's all about bureaucracy. It's all about policy change and legislation. Less, all this money will be spending for wars, will be sending to these different countries. Uh, these high tax rates, tax bills, all everything was being inflated. Let's put it back in the communities where needed. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're in the trouble, where the so-called trouble is on beginning at. Let's put these, let's go to these, um, we do surveys. Let's get, let's see what's going on inside these houses. Let's see what's going on inside these school systems. Mm -hmm. Why so much neglect and abandonment going on? Mm -hmm. Why so much social and domestic abuse going on? Mm -hmm. You know, where the father's at? You know, the drugs, what was just dropped in, what was just dropped in our communities played a big part of it. No mm -hmm. one is speaking about that. That's quiet. You know, our parents, you know, my daddy, you no, know, I haven't seen him since 1979 mm -hmm. in out the prison system. But that's just not my father. It's many women and uh, men like that. And kids have to suffer from that. Mm -hmm. They've been told these um, drastic lies, right? And so all those things um, need to be addressed and answered instead of just sitting on these big houses and these on these hills in these lofty positions, you know, and saying uh, what needs and saying that we can't change. Mm -hmm. But that's a lie because Mara and myself and many other men and women are here proving them wrong. We can change. We're doing positive things in the community every day. Every day. Every day. And our and our growth and our change is exemplifying who we are. Absolutely. And that's why that's why we have motivated to help others. That's why we have 100 years enterprise and many other um movement organizations, what's going on out here, you know, to really just show, hey, we change. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Um, so you both mentioned resources. So give me a quick rundown. Somebody writes you a blank check, a, a blank piece of legislation about what we need out here to help people who are coming home and to make sure that they don't go in to begin with. Myra, what do we need? Housing, uh, training. Like a lot of these women don't know how to open a bank account. They don't know nothing about insurance. They, some of them don't even know how to bathe proper hygiene and it's not their fault it's because mm -hmm. they got addicted to drugs mm -hmm. you know what I mean but the the key thing here is housing don't take me wrong Fahim but there's more resources for the men than it is for the women and that's not cool the one place that we did have they closed it so if somebody gave me a blank check there are so many women like Amina Colbert, I would get her involved. Betty McKay, I would get her involved. Deidre Wilson, I would get her involved. And we would sit down at a round table with that check and find some housing and start right there. Housing. Housing. Absolutely. Housing. Housing. Housing cures a lot of ills. Um, Fahim, you got a blank check. Legislators are going to do whatever you want with a wave of a wand. What, what do we need? Uh Myra said it best. First of all, we need housing. We need, you know, and more resources for women. I agree. We need we need more programs, more sustainable programs. What's going to help, you know, programs. Because when we say housing, now what's going on inside? We need uh, programs inside those houses. It's going to teach life skills. Mm -hmm. What's going to teach um, the fundamentals of um, acclimation back into society. What's mm -hmm. going to teach um, coaching, um, coping skills. What's going to teach um, financial literacy. And mm -hmm. things of that nature. So when you come back, because now you have to be able to live all over again. So the proper training, what's going on through these houses, we're going to need more um, pre-apprenticeship programs for those who want to go to the, for those who want to go, you know, re-enter uh, to become uh, career defined, you know, to, to, to go into the workforce. You know, women is what, 15 to 20% of the uh, construction field. We need more than that. Mm -hmm. You know, I work at um, in a construction pre-apprenticeship program right now. We need more women coming through, uh, especially in California, especially in the Bay Area, especially in Richmond, mm -hmm. Vallejo, San Francisco. We need more programs. You know, uh, submit these blank checks. Submit one to motivate to help others. 100 Years Enterprise. And we're going to show you what we can do with it because mm -hmm. we're doing the work every day with no funding. With no, we come yep. out of our pockets yep. with no funding. 
You know, my woman, she, she do what she can to put together. I got two brothers, Dante, Dante Gans and Patrick Scott. We put this together. We, we, we go hard every day to do what we need to do just to show them. We're going to juvenile halls. Uh, we're trying to get to the, uh, to, uh, to the school system, to the school district, Oakland, um, whether it's West Country, Council County, daily. You know, so it's all about building growth and become the people, what I call it, um, the whole fillers, because there's so many holes and gaps, mm -hmm. right? And in any in, in, in bridges, what's been broken. So we're trying to put all those things together. So we need that and more, but I can go on and on. Oh, yeah. On the note of resources, it, it, and Alexandra, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe the United States spends around $81 billion annually on incarceration. So it's not about tax hikes. It's not about this or that. It's about reallocating resources away from one thing and into some of these issues. Well, I mean, we are the lead incarcerator in the world by a fairly significant margin. We have over, I think, about 70,000 people, a little bit more serving life without parole. Um, and that's before we get into virtual life sentences, right? Um, you know, which is sort of its own battle. But I, I want to say a sincere thank you to all of the panelists. Um, thank you for making this project. Myron Fahim, thank you for sharing your story. And yes. thank you for everything that you're out here doing in society. So the way that I always end is, how can people help you? Myra, where can they send resources, follow you online? What can people who are on this panel or watching this online do to help your mission? Well, I'm part of the Women's Social Entrepreneurship Center in Oakland. It's on the court of the address is 1406 Seminary. And I went through the program there. It was sponsored by Mills College mm -hmm. and Professor Darcell. She's the executive over there and Kimberly Williams. They work there. If you want to do something, donate some money to that place. Because that's where I hang. That's where I do my thing. That's where I started my cleaning service. And mm -hmm. that's where they're working with women that are coming home. So that's where my check is going. And then from there, we're going to buy us a house. Okay. So if you want to contribute, kick in. All right. Everybody do what Myra says. Fahim, yeah. how can people support you and your work? You can go to my website, motivatedhelpothers.org. Um, you can email me at motivatedhelpothers at gmail.com. Mm -hmm. You can find me on Facebook, on Willis Instagram. And my other project with my three, with my two brothers is called 100 Years Enterprise. You can go to, um, to the website. It's 100 years. Um, dot biz, spelled with the one, H-U-N-D-R-E-D, dot biz. And those are the things that we have going on in order to, um, to help save our kids, to save our community, save our people, and to continue to give. You know, to a society and to communities that we help messed up. Yeah. Absolutely. And last but most certainly not least, the leaders of our project. Where can folks find you? How can they help you do do the next big big storytelling? Ben? All right, I'll take the lead. Uh, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can find me on social media, O-G-P-E-N-N -N on Twitter and Instagram. Again, I'm a journalist. I write about arts and culture in the Bay Area, um, specifically for KQED, where I host a podcast called Right Nowish, and I write a column about arts and culture in Northern California. Uh, this project, Facing Life, is at facing.life. Please check it out. Take in the stories. Um, spend some time and just look at the individuals. Look at them as people. And let that be a metaphor or let that be a lesson for how you should view people in general. Formerly incarcerated people, people, period. We live in a very fast paced society. So this is a request to slow down and enjoy people. Brendan. Absolutely. Um, Sorry, Brendan, go ahead. Oh, no, 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 that, that's good. You wrapped it up. Cool. Well, again, um, we're going to move to questions, but thank you to everybody who, who was on this panel. Thank you to everybody who joined us and who's watching at home. Um, you can find us at thesentencingproject.org, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, we have a lot of information about mass incarceration, about how we got here and where we need to go. So if you are somebody who likes to dig into the facts, visit us at thesentencingproject.org. So um, now, Holly, I'm going to turn this over to the questions section here. So folks, if you have questions, uh, throw them in the chat. Um, but I saw some up here and it says, what is the special thing Brandon did, Myra? <laughs> okay, so Brandon was going to Hong Kong, right? Brandon was going to Hong Kong on a trip, him and his, his girl. 
And I said, bring me back a souvenir, you know. And, you know, he's a guy I'm thinking, yeah, okay, he, he, he's going to forget. He's not going to bring me nothing. He comes back and he brings me these, these little pillows. They're about this big, handmade, with these little cats on them. And I was, like, just totally blown back. Not, I was blown back at the fact that he remembered to bring me something. But I was blown back at the fact that how I wish I had a, they are so like awesome. And I, I got them hid. I wish somebody would put their hands on them. They come back <laughs> with no digits. They're beautiful. But he, 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 he admitted that his girl picked them out. But then when he said his girl picked them out, that means that he talks about me to her. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? He personalized our relationship. Mm-hmm. And that means more to me than you can ever think of, dude. I think I would probably scrap over you right about now. Uh-huh. And then, you Little know, my cats, boy Brandon. Pen. Yeah, they're, but they're, they're, they're a symbol of money. Okay. They're good luck charms for money. Okay. The good way. Little cats, don't fail. Little Thank cats. you, Brandon. I know what to yeah. get everybody for, uh, for the holidays now. <laughs> Kim and Myra, what advice do you give to the fellow inmates that are still fighting to get out? Fahim, we'll start with you. Uh, do not lose hope. And the key word is stay fighting. Never give up. Never give up. Do not lose hope. Uh, I know it's easy to say, it, but try not to fall into despair. Because despair is going to cause that depression and it eats you up on the inside. Mm-hmm. Stay in the programs. All stay to the necessary programs help you to define who you are as a human being and to be able to prepare yourself you can to come back to the society and to stay connected to the society the best way you can don't do like i did and hold a cell phone but you know the letter writings and good um family members um friendship create those um relationships and um and i believe that will help because it helped me all right Myra, what are your words to your family on the inside? The same thing. It, I agree with Fahim 100%. Don't lose hope. Don't let nobody tell you that it can't happen because it can. All of you ladies, all of y'all knew me and you know me and you know how I was in prison and you know how I changed in prison and now you know I'm free. So if I can change, anybody can. Hang on to that hope. Don't let nobody tell you nothing. Believe in yourself. That's the key thing. And then believe in your higher power, God, Allah, the cheese. I don't care what it is, but believe in it and stay true to it. On that note, you know, as the project has been kind of been disseminated online, both Ken and I have been receiving kind of, you know, direct messages on Instagram and Twitter from, you know, people in media, formerly incarcerated people, but also currently incarcerated people. Um, I've gotten a few DMs on Instagram. The project is being passed around, you know, inside California prisons. And so Myra and Fahim, you know, people are learning from your stories and, and actively seeing that now. Wow. Right. And um, as somebody who works to pass this type of legislation, thank you for being the living proof that we can all hold up to every state legislature that attempts to tell us no. Um, I've got to go face one down tomorrow. So actually, this was the perfect shot in the arm to remind me what we're fighting for. Um, thank you all so much for what you, you've you done um, with this project. Thank you all again for sharing your stories. Um, Brandon, you made me cry oh, as a, on a panel. I will never forgive you. Sorry. Um, and thank you very much to the Pulitzer Center for putting this together. Yeah, thank you all so much. Um, I think, you know, unless there are other questions, um, we're probably going to wrap up. But, you know, just wanted to remind everyone that we will have a recording of this on our website um, in the coming days and would love to see you share that out. Um, it's really been an incredible conversation. I and... think someone else has a question, is it? Oh, oh yeah. One, one last one. Um, you want to take it? <laughs> it's one thing to read your stories and a whole nother to hear your voices on this event. So I guess that means we're going to have to hold more events, Holly, huh? What do you think? <laughs> yeah. And this another project. Thank you. Um, well, I am going to go ahead and 
wrap us up. Um, we appreciate you all for, for joining us today. Um, and you know everyone in the audience too, thank you. You're an important part of this work and um, you help us keep going too. So if you are able um, to become a Pulitzer Center champion and donate to our work so we can continue supporting people like Brandon and Penn too, uh, we'd really appreciate that. Uh, but in the meantime, also would love uh, for you to join in our future events. You can find them by visiting pulitzercenter.org slash events. And um, finally, just a reminder, please do stick around for a few minutes after the webinar ends for our survey. Thank you again and bye for now. Thanks everybody. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Take care of yourselves. <laughs>